I'm going to turn things over to Ali Abbas, who's an associate professor at the University of Sydney, and he'll make the connection to George. Thank you, Frank. And uh, of course, first of all, thank you to George for the kind invitation to have me here and to, it's my pleasure to chair this session. Uh, I am uh, one of George's grandchildren, a proud grandchild, and that's probably by accident. Uh, I didn't know about George at that time when I started the PhD or about the Sergeant Tree. I uh, bumped into Professor Jose Romanoli one time up the stairs in the Department of Chemical Engineering. That's what, what the name of the school was back then. And I was in his process control class, and there was a quick chat there, and he said, OK, you're starting a PhD with me. I, he knew my intentions to do a PhD, so I did start and uh, eventually graduate in 2004. So but I, I didn't know George, but I knew George through the textbook, of course. It's, um, kind of, it was a commodity. That was the only textbook I paid for, in fact, during my university days, and I kept it. But it's an agony, and it continues to be an agony, because I think somebody stole it, and I've never recovered it. So it's, uh, as I said, one of my agonies, and I think about that. Uh, but I enjoyed the process control class tremendously, and I guess, even though I didn't know George, I had the PSE genes in me, I guess, uh, from back then. Uh, I was... Um, at uh, Harvard here uh, on a uh, Harvard Australia Fellowship visiting uh, for a month or so in 2011. And I decided to come and knock on uh, George's door in the department here. Uh, on that day, he wasn't there. But as I do remember coming along, uh, you know, having that connection, even though I have not met George before, thinking that, yes, I can come and uh, say hello to him. He wasn't, uh, it wasn't an opportunity for me to meet him on that, in that year. I had to wait for another few years in 2016, last year, when I was doing sabbatical here in Boston. Uh, this time, I sent him an email, and I made an appointment, and he was so kind to receive me. We had a good meeting. That was the first time I met, I met you, George. It was a pleasure. Very good, excellent conversation, and really from yesterday's session and today's session, I also uh, you know, learned more about the impact George has uh, in, on people and on the field. Because in that meeting, George, you had big impact on me. There were some questions about my career I was raising to George, and he made them sound so easy, so simple. Uh, good answers, and that helped me a lot. And I take also from that meeting something he said, I share with everybody. Be the best academic you can. So I thank you for that, George. Uh, and so the reason I also met George that time is because I wanted to discuss with him about his papers in the area of nanoscale process systems engineering, which was something I started to think about a few years ago with some of my students. We're actually doing some research in that area right now trying to do some uh, control of self-assembly with DNA, origami, and other uh, uh, nanomolecules. So George also recommended me to meet some uh, people. And yesterday, also in the dinner, it just happened, maybe it was by fortune, that I was sitting on the same table that on my right was one of George's last PhD students also working in self-assembly, or the control of self-assembly. And on my left, uh, our first speaker, which I'll introdu introduce shortly, also working on the, in the area of control of self-assembly. So it probably was an act of God, or uh, perhaps just pure fortune. So just to move on the session, uh, it's great to be here again. It's a great conference, and uh, I'll move on to introduce the first speaker. Our first speaker in this session and also, I should thank George for giving me one of, I think, the hardest sessions to introduce because such interesting names and such interesting <laughs> titles. So, the first speaker is, is uh, Professor Venkat, uh, Venkata Subramanian. And Venkat and George had common interest in the area of uh, artificial intelligence since the mid-1980s when they became close academic colleagues and friends. Uh, they organized symposia, taught industrial short courses, prepared and distributed um, educational material, and had interminable uh, discussions on the uh, 
uh, in the future on the future of artificial intelligence. Uh, today, he is at Columbia University as the Samuel Rubin Pira G. Veal Professor of Engineering and Co-Director of Center for Management of Systemic Risk. And his interests include uh, three primary areas. One is the risk uh, analysis and management in complex engineered systems. Two, cyber infrastructure and big data analytics for molecular product uh, design and discovery. And three, complex adaptive tele teleological systems. These areas are uh, being tackled or addressed using a combination of artificial intelligence, informatics, statistics, and mathematical programming techniques, and uh, carried out in his newly found, uh, founded Complex Resilient Intelligent Systems Lab, Chris Lab, at Columbia. Uh, he has a Bachelor of uh, Technology from University of Madras in Chemical Engineering, a Master's from Vanderbilt University in Physics, and a PhD from Cornell University. So it's my great pleasure to have had dinner with you last night and also introduce you today, Venkat, please come forward. Join me to welcome Venkat. Thank you, Agu. Good, great. Uh, thanks, Ali, for the uh, nice introduction. And good afternoon, everyone. I hope uh, you all enjoyed your lunch and ready for your nap. I'll try not to disturb you too much. Uh, uh, it's, it's really a delight for me to be here uh, to celebrate George's uh, career uh, and his uh, retirement. Um, and uh, thank you very much, George, for the kind invitation to make a presentation at this wonderful symposium. Uh, as my title suggests, um, I'm going to talk about AI and its uh, uh, promise in uh, process systems engineering. And my objectives are threefold. I'll start with a quick review of what happened and what did not happen in the last 30 years or so, and then try to make some educated guesses about what might happen in the next 30 years with all the caveats about the dangers in making predictions. And uh, I'll try to focus on the intellectual challenges, which is where I think academics uh, should focus on, even though there are also important implementational and organizational challenges as we go forward uh, with AI. Uh, my talk is a, a kind of a broad overview, not a very detailed, uh, in-depth uh, discussion. Uh, if you're interested, there are a couple of uh, perspective articles I wrote on this topic, uh, which I get into some more of the uh, details. So there are lots of branches of AI, but I think these two highlighted ones are the ones of most relevance and immediate import importance to us in PSE, what used to be called expert systems or knowledge-based systems, and uh, machine learning. So that's what I'll largely focus on. So. Um, AI is essentially, oops, sorry. AI essentially is um, about problem solving and decision making uh, under complex conditions as defined by these kind of uh, features of the kind of problems uh, AI systems typically have worked on. ill pose problems, there are model uncertainties, large spaces, nonlinearities, and so on and so forth. And, but these are problems, these are features that are applicable to many problems we see in PSC, uh, in design control and optimization. So a bunch of us thought in the mid 80s, okay, so let's look at those kinds of problems from an AI perspective. And here's a list of some of the active researchers uh, from that era, Jim Davis is uh, here. I noticed Mark Kramer used to be here at MIT, was very active, of course, George, Lyle Unger at Penn, and Art Westerberg, who was uh, kind of like the uh, academic forefather uh, for all of us uh, in this area. And we expected significant impact uh, from AI, like what optimization and MPC did in the subsequent years. But by and large, uh, it did not happen for AI. And why not? Before I answer that question, uh, let me review the different phases of AI as, as I see it. Uh, in PSC. Phase one is what I call as uh, the expert systems era, 
uh, lasted uh, roughly, started certainly in 83, and you could say, you know, mid-90s is when maybe uh, the transition occurred to the next phase. And again, these were some of the active people. And um, this is, in my understanding, this is the first ever expert system application in chemical engineering that was developed in 1983, and that's from Mark Westerberg and his uh, PhD student, uh, René Benyaris, Alcantara, who teaches at Oxford now. So this is a system for predicting uh, thermophysical properties uh, 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 of complex uh, uh, fluid mixtures. And it was quickly followed by Decade, again from Art and uh, René. And this is uh, an expert system for catalyst design. And so they're really forerunners uh, to, uh, and they kind of defined the uh, algorithms uh, for uh, you know, solving various kinds of problems. Mean sent analysis, for example, was introduced there. And knowledge representations, uh, frames were used, for example, for the first time in Decade. And uh, Confide was programmed in Ops5, as you may recall, Art. Uh, the production system language developed at Carnegie Mellon. And then we did some work at uh, Columbia on developing model-based expert systems for diagnosis. And of course, a whole bunch of stuff came from George's shop here at MIT, starting with Design Kit in 1987, which has been referred to already. And I saw Michael Mauro Viniotis is here as one of the developers. Charlie Saliti was uh, one of the students who worked on and the batch design kit, which Andreas worked on later on, it all came out of that. And then Modella, of course, with Gabriella and her husband. So there's a whole bunch of expert system related things that happened uh, in that period. And the Lispy Consortium, uh, which was referred to earlier, was founded at the time. And the first course in, uh, on teaching AI in PSC was also uh, from that era. So in 1986, uh, George published uh, this paper with the title Artificial Intelligence Process Engineering. It's the graduate education issue of uh, CEE where he outlined a research program for AI in process systems engineering and then based on the consortium and its plans going forward and so on and so forth. Now, coincidentally, in the same issue, I had a paper with the same title, exactly the same title, which uh, described AI in process systems engineering based on the graduate course I had developed and taught at uh, Columbia, where I kind of outlined what kind of topics we should be looking at and we should be teaching. And it kind of mirrored what uh, George had outlined as the research program. And the thing was, George did not know I was doing this at Columbia, and I didn't know George uh, was doing this at the time. In fact, uh, much to my embarrassment, uh, I did not know who George was. And, you know, of course, those of you in the systems area would be shocked. I mean, this is uh, uh, almost sacrilege. But then you recall that I was, I was not a systems guy. You know, I don't belong to any one of these, uh, you, know, uh, you know, these uh, famous trees. Uh, so uh, my PhD thesis uh, was in statistical mechanics, and that was with Keith Govins. And it is uh, through a some fortunate uh, accidents, I ended up in uh, process systems. So the only systems guy I knew at that time, and it's a miracle that Columbia hired me, uh, that the only systems guy I knew was Art Westerberg. And that too, because I was a postdoc in computer science at Carnegie Mellon, and Art uh, was uh, at um, um, you know, CMU in Chemie. And I knew his student, René, very well. And so through René, I met Art. And again, much to my embarrassment, I did not know Ignacio Grossman, and, uh, who was teaching at the time. Larry, I don't think, had joined by the time, so he's, he saved me from that embarrassment. So uh, anyway, so both of us published uh, uh, with the same title in, sorry, sorry, uh, in, in, the, in, this, in the same issue. And uh, the next year, George and I organized uh, the first AI conference uh, uh, in PSC at uh, Columbia. See George Stephanopoulos here. Uh, that's uh, Professor Chandrasekharan from Ohio State, who is uh, Jim Davis's uh, mentor and collaborator, and of course, uh, Art uh, over there. As you can see, he doesn't look all that different now. So there's a billion dollar healthcare uh, thing you're working on, Art. And uh, George uh, then soon developed a, a five day version of. Uh, Expert Systems and Process Engineering course, which we first start at MIT, along with uh, Lyle Unger. And uh, the next year, 
we took the course on the road to Porto Carras in Greece. And so there we taught the course for five days and uh, there were about 70, 80 participants from all over Europe. And this location is exactly the same one where uh, escape happened uh, in 2011. And, and I have a kind of a mystical feeling about this place because the first time I appeared on this uh, spot was June 88 where I was at Columbia but leaving for Purdue. And the next time I showed up here in 2011, I was at Purdue coming back to Columbia. So, so I think this place, you know, it should go along with the Oracle of Delphi or something like that. And, I'm sorry? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> you know, it's not in my hands, as you know. <laughs> you know there is a, yeah, yeah, I was going to say that. Oh, come on, don't steal my lines. So this is George Stephanopoulos. I mean, it was a wonderful course. During the day, it was really hard work. And then in the evenings, you know, enjoyable dinners. And that's uh, uh, George, of course. And that's Jakobus Vasalos, who was here yesterday. There he is. Yes. So I'm, I'm glad you showed up, because I was hoping you'll be there. That's Jakobus. And that's Lyle Unger. And that's uh, his girlfriend. He's married to someone else now. Uh, <laughs> And that's uh, my wife at the time, and I'm still married to her. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and George entertain, entertained us with his uh, Greek dances. And so there is George, and that's Eleni. And uh, you know who this guy was? That's John McGregor. And John was there coincidentally at the time teaching a short course in, in, uh, in PSA, and that's where I met him first. And you can't see that very well. That's my wife sitting there, and on her lap is Elby. And that was the last time I saw Elby, and then until last night. And uh, uh, clearly, she's. <laughs> uh, oh, by the way, the kids did an amazing job, both Nico and Elby. Uh, so, and one of the highlights of that uh, visit was the personal tour of Plaka that George gave my wife and I uh, at the time. We spent three hours after lunch wandering around, so it was just beautiful. Anyway, so that was phase one, and phase two is what I would say is the emergence of neural networks. Uh, it's all started largely with the backpropagation algorithm, which came about in 86 through the works of Hinton and others. Then there's a whole bunch of papers that were published in uh, neural networks. I'm just highlighting uh, some key ones, uh, Jim Davis and a student, Whitley, had some work on art. Uh, David Himmelblau uh, actually had a bunch of papers on uh, uh, neural networks. Mark Kramer, of course, was very active. Uh, and of course, McAvoy's group, Button, uh, Naveen Button Bakoy and Chin Jochin is here. Uh, they are so Joe's, uh, Jochin's work, and of course, Bakshin Stephanopoulos, it's a well-known WaveNet's work, Lyle Unger, and so on. So this was largely driven by neural net uh, excitement. But there was also ongoing work on expert systems and genetic algorithms at the time. But most of the work on the neural networks was on the control and uh, fault diagnosis side. And one of the highlights from that era is this ASM program that uh, Honeywell led, the uh, Abnormal Events Management Program, which was uh, a consortium of all the leading oil companies and some vendors like uh, Jensen. $17 million funding for five years, half of which came from the NIST uh, ATP program, the other half from the participants. And there were three universities involved, uh, Jim from Ohio State and uh, Kim Vincente from uh, uh, Toronto. And you could, you could say that this is actually the forerunner to the smart manufacturing initiative that uh, Tom Edgar and um, Richard talked about this morning. Because when you look at all the plans they have for it, they're kind of similar to you know, what uh, we had in ASM, as Jim uh, might uh, recall. And um, uh, at uh, Purdue, as part of the uh, uh, work, we developed this uh, uh, system called DKIT, uh, which based on the Blackboard architecture, which used a variety of uh, um, diagnostic techniques, sign diagrams, observers, trend analysis, rule-based systems, and neural networks and PCA. And, and the system successfully anticipated and diagnosed uh, based on real-time data for the, from the Exxon's uh, BRCP plant, that's the Baton Rouge chemical plant. And uh, it was licensed to Honeywell with the anticipation that it will be commercialized and so on, but really nothing much happened. 
Now, looking back, it's clear, uh, and that's because uh, I think we were about 20 to 30 years too early uh, on this problem. So why wasn't AI not as impactful uh, uh, as uh, some of us had anticipated? Well, it's for the same reason it was not impactful in other domains, not just chemi. And that's due to a lot of these things which were lacking. We were lacking the computational power, the storage, communication, the uh, software environments were clunky. I mean, all my students, like Georgia students, were programming in uh, Lisp. And, uh, and then the costs were prohibitive, even for whatever things we could uh, achieve. So there was no technology push, really. And there was no market pull either, in the sense there were lots of low-hanging fruits, which could be solved by optimization and MPC kind of uh, things. And so the incentives, uh, economic incentives, were in that direction. So people went along that way. And so there was no need to go after these challenging uh, AI problems. On top of that, you know, as we all know, uh, it takes about 40 to 50 years for technology to penetrate and have widespread impact. Uh, I recall uh, the uh, slide that Larry Evans showed at the Cash 40th uh, anniversary where he showed from the, day, uh, from the time simulation was kind of demonstrated at Monsanto and so on, and then Aspen came along and then had 95% market penetration, it took 50 years. And uh, Ignacio uh, shared with me that uh, you know, a similar thing happened in the ELP, MNLP, uh, uh, you know, 40 to 50 years for widespread adoption or adoption of these things. So, uh, so relatively speaking, uh, AI at the time when we were doing all these things were like 20 years old, something like that. So we were still early in, the, in, the, in that S-shaped curve that usually uh, follows. So what's different now? Well, rumor uh, in 1985, uh, is, as Tom Edgar would say, the badass computer was, uh, uh, you know, great too. You know, it was the, the, the big beast. Uh, it was the fastest computer at the time, 1.9 gigaflops, 150 kilowatts of power. So it's essentially a heat engine that could also do computing. <laughs> And uh, $32 million in today's dollars, $16 million in uh, $85. So that was Cray. So what would Cray look like now? You know, Cray 2? I'll show you what Cray 2 looks like now. My Apple Watch. Apple Watch is actually more powerful than Cray 2. Three gigaflops, just one watt of power, and $300. So that's what is different now. And this is just the hardware side. I'm not even talking about the software improvements. So there is a performance gain of 150, 200,000 fold per performance per unit cost. And this is a game changer. So what happened? Basically, Moore's Law happened. So 30 years of Moore's Law, even though it may be saturating now and Amdahl's Law is kicking in and so on, but you know, Moore's Law basically made these things happen, that computational improvements in uh, power and storage led to other things such as better software environments and so on and so forth. So the technology push is here. And the market pull, I believe, is also here because many of the low-hanging fruits uh, are being picked or are sometimes uh, largely picked. So for further efficiency improvements, you got to go up the chain. And, and so that means bringing in some of this AI business. And um, so I think there is convergence which we didn't have before. Okay. So, uh, so I think history will say that there are three important milestones in AI. One is Deep Blue defeating Gary Kasparov. The other one would be Watson in Jeopardy. And the third one happened last year with AlphaGo. And um, so now we have entered phase three, which is essentially broadly we have been calling as data science or predictive analytics. And the three important exciting ideas here are the deep learning neural nets, again from uh, Hinton shop, and, uh, uh, and statistical machine learning, and reinforcement learning. And these are the technologies which are behind these uh, big AI success stories in natural language processing, robotics, and vision, Watson AlphaGo, self-driving cars. These are the things uh, behind those things. Okay. So what will it take to develop a Watson-like application for PSC? Okay. Now, this is really a hard problem. 
you know, Watson is very impressive, no question about it, but Watson for PSC is a lot harder because we are not just dealing with qualitative facts anymore because that's what Jeopardy was about, you know. Uh, and uh, you have to deal with quantitative information, mathematical models, data from all kinds of uh, representations, heuristic knowledge. And so this is a really hard problem. So I'll give you uh, 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 an impression of what Watson might look like and based on a couple of things I worked on. This would be a Watson-like system for pharmaceutical engineering where let's say the system has all this knowledge about various models, experimental data, and then material science related things, and all these things are all tied together with various ontologies. But as a user, you don't see any of them. They're all behind this Watson. And let's say suddenly, you know, your, the recent batch of tablets you produced has dissolution problems. And then you want to know, oh, what went wrong? And so you look up the dissolution profile, and then you see that the theory was predicting the data quite well, and suddenly the recent batches are all over the map, and so you actually go back and you want to check uh, the DEM simulations, which were developed in order to develop this kind of uh, control and operation, and to see whether some of the assumptions have been violated, and then you even go back to five-year-old data on electronic notebooks that are over there, and then maybe examine the controls, uh, the crystal structure, and so on and so forth. So this is what Watson would look like, and then as this, this work was done as part of the NSF uh, ERC on pharmaceutical uh, engineering that was between Rutgers and Purdue, so this work was done when I was at Purdue. And so this was like a prototype, uh, kind of like a demo version of what is possible, but to go from this to reality uh, where people can routinely use this in Pfizer and, and, and Novartis and Lilly, uh, we are looking at, I would say, about 20 years of work. And um, uh, so the intellectual challenges here are in developing ontologies, hybrid models which combine first principles models with data-driven models, and domain-specific compilers. These are the kind of things where uh, we need uh, more work. And computer scientists are not going to do these things because these are, this requires domain uh, understanding. So people who know pharmaceutical engineering or chemical engineering, or if this is for catalyst design, we really need to learn these uh, jargon and technologies, and then actually create uh, those kinds of models. Uh, another one is uh, the more recent work we did at uh, Columbia, where we have a system which can read um, uh, scientific articles and as PDF files, and then extract different uh, pieces of information, uh, equations, and, uh, and then various uh, chemical names, and so on, and then store them as semantically rich representations. Uh, it's a system we call Holmes. Uh, it's a play on Watson and Holmes. And, uh, and, and so the new things here are various machine learning things, natural language pro processing uh, algorithms, and representations and uh, ontologies. So I think in phase three, which is what we are in right now, uh, I believe there are three kinds of challenges, uh, implementational, organizational, and intellectual. I believe many of the problems in smart manufacturing initiative, uh, there are many relevant algorithms and knowledge modeling frameworks uh, already developed from the 80s and uh, 90s, and it'll be well worthwhile for all the people, particularly the young folks who are getting involved, to go back and take a look at them. And some of them were already mentioned, the uh, ideas behind Modella in design kit, batch design kit. Uh, there's a lot of things which, uh, uh, which, which were about 20 to 30 years too early. So there are implementation challenges which will show up in, in uh, smart manufacturing, particularly how do we integrate all these things, how do we manage these things, there will be organizational things. And these were the main limitations for us uh, with the Honeywell program. But the intellectual challenges for academics are here, developing these hybrid models, ontologies, compilers, semantic search engines, and so on. But I think the really, really exciting intellectual challenge is the phase which is not here yet. One could say maybe it started around 2010. This is the business of self-organizing intelligent system. Okay? So here the question is, how do we model, predict, and control the behavior of a large population of self-organizing intelligent systems 
These would be like the drone swarms and driverless car fleets, for example, or self-assembling nanostructures, just to quote a couple of examples. And that's basically the science of emergence. And this is, this is, to me, this is really exciting. There are all kinds of possibilities here, and this is where the grand conceptual challenges are. Now, if you look at 20th century science, it was largely reductionist in its approach. We took macro uh, uh, matters, and then we went down, we tried to understand their properties in terms of molecules, then to the nucleus, then the atoms, and the neutrons and protons, then quarks, and maybe strings. So the whole thing was driven uh, to the bottom. And quantum mechanics and elementary particle physics and standard model, all those things came out as a result. Even biology went down this route, where they were able to trace all the biological properties to molecular structures like double helix and so on. But can reductionism answer the following question, which is, given the properties of a single neuron, can we predict the behavior of a system of, of an organized system of 100 billion neurons? An individual neuron is not self-aware, it's not conscious, but when you organize 100 billion of them, and suddenly this whole thing is self-aware, and, and ask questions like, who am I, why am I here? How long is this boring lecture? <laughs> and so how do we go from neuron to brain to mind? That is, how do you go from parts to system? Reductionism cannot answer this because we are not reducing things anymore. We are putting things back. So this is now bottom-up strategy. Reductionism is a top-down strategy. Now, this reminds me of a lecture that Lord Kelvin gave at the dawn of the 20th century at the Royal Society. And the title was 19th Century Clouds Over the Dynamic Theory of Heat and Light. And he said, this is Lord Kelvin, you know, we have temperatures named after him, right? So he said, well, folks, we pretty much know everything that is to know about physics of the universe, except for two small problems. He said there are two small clouds that remain over the horizon. So you could see that Kelvin had this intuition that it's not everything is quite right. And these two clouds revolutionized 20th century physics. One was the black body radiation problem, which gave birth to quantum mechanics. And the other one is the null result of the michelson morley experiment, which gave birth to special relativity in 05 and general relativity in 1915. I think in a similar vein, there is a large cloud actually hanging at the dawn of the 21st century, which is this problem. How do you go from parts to whole? And you need a constructionist theory. It's not a reductionist paradigm. You need a constructionist paradigm, a theory of emergent behavior, which would require, in my mind, a conceptual synthesis across these different fields, from artificial intelligence, systems engineering, even statistical mechanics, game theory, and of course, the relevant biology. So what might such a theory look like? Okay. Now, we want to go from individual agents to collective uh, system-wide properties, we actually know how to do that in one particular case. When the agents are dumb in the sense they don't make up their own minds, they are prisoners of Newton's laws, you have uh, molecules. When we have small number of those, you have classical mechanics. Planetary motion oh, is a great success. We have millions of them, you have statistical mechanics, which is also a tremendous success. But what if those agents are intelligent? such as people. Well, classical mechanics was the inspiration for neoclassical economics. So economic ideas, you know, the use of demand and supply forces and so on, they all come out of classical mechanics. So you would think, oh, then what is the statmic analog in economics? Because that would be the appropriate model here when you have millions of agents, people uh, transacting in a free market. So what is the statistical mechanics analog of uh, of in, in, in economics. Well, people tried this for 100 years and gave up because of this problem. What do you do with entropy? So once you say statmic in economics, the 800-pound gorilla in the room is entropy. 
So what is entropy? Now, as entropy as a measure of disorder is a major problem for economics because we know markets work well when there is more order, not disorder. So why would we want to maximize disorder? Now, this has been a conceptual block for 100 years. And uh, I kind of solved this a few years ago by reinterpreting entropy as a measure of fairness in a distribution. So if you really, I don't have the time to get into this, but if you really think about it, and I'm happy to talk about it later on, it's really measuring uh, the fair reassignment of probabilities in a distribution on a fair basis. So, so that allowed me to take statistical mechanics and generalize it to include intelligent systems. And, and uh, I'm calling this uh, discipline as um, statistical teleodynamics. Now, as George knows, and all my Greek friends in the audience would know, telos means goal in Greek. And so just in thermodynamics, the dynamics of the agents are driven by thermal energy. Here, the dynamics of the people are driven by their goals, their aspirations, their need to maximize utility, and so on and so forth. So it is statistical teleodynamics. And instead of two laws, we have four laws here. And uh, in the case of dumb agents, these two laws uh, for us, uh, you know, basically you get statistical thermodynamics back as the limiting case of statistical teleodynamics. So what uh, we were able to do is that, uh, um, so this enables us to prove that there is an equilibrium that will be reached by maximizing fairness, which is same as maximizing entropy. And it proves that this equilibrium is not only statistical, it's also a Nash equilibrium. And then uh, stat, uh, Telio reveals a deep connection between stat statistical mechanics and game theory, which we didn't know existed before. And uh, the theory proves the existence, uniqueness, optimality, and asymptotic stability of this equilibrium using layoff and kind of ideas. And then it finally proves the emergence of an income distribution that is log normal in an ideal free market. So that is the fairest inequality that we ought to see. And so that now provides guidelines for tax policies and executive compensation and so on. And just want to uh, show you uh, uh, a quick uh, result. Uh, uh, so we, since we know what the share should be for the top 1% of the population, the bottom 90%, and the one in between, we can define an ideal inequality coefficient, psi, which is zero if the society is fair, and it'll be non-zero if it's unfair. And uh, so in a fair society, the bottom 90% share should be along the 0% line. And this is from Norway. And it shows that it's not zero, but it's quite close. And in fact, it's about 5 to 7% over the last 25 years. Uh, Eric Itzti should be happy about the society he is from. And uh, that is actually for the top 10 to 1%. And so you can see what the bottom 99%, they are hugging the 0% line quite closely. The top 1% are doing much better, of course, 100% more than their fair share. Uh, but this is the best case. So, so for the Norwegians, and this is true for the Swedes and the Scandinavians in general, the bottom 99% are being treated more or less fairly, and they have a fair share of the income pie that is created as a society. And in some sense, you know, this is, these are like the ideal gas-like systems for economics. The worst offender is, of course, US. So Eric Isti made the wrong transition from Norway to the US. Uh, the bottom 90%, they are making 24% less than what their fair share is. The middle making 22% more, and of course, we know the top 1% are doing very well. And even the US wasn't that bad. If you look at the 30 years after the Second World War, and this is all income data, that Thomas Piketty had uh, uh, published in his book uh, three years ago. So from 1945 to 1975, there were the, so there were only about 12% below. So even the US was uh, uh, you know, more or less, uh, uh, on economic sense, fair, uh, a much better society than it is now. So um, if you're interested more, uh, this is all coming out uh, as a book next month. Uh, it's basically the mathematical and conceptual foundations of uh, statistical teleodynamics, which is a, a conceptual syn synthesis along those lines. And essentially, it's theory of emergence uh, for the income distribution. And uh, going back to this problem, um, 
I believe we'll need something along the lines I just mentioned. Uh, the, the one I just talked about doesn't have any AI component in it or biology in it, but something along those lines will be needed as we try to develop the science of uh, emergence. And so to conclude, and getting back to PSC, um, I think um, the really exciting challenges are at the intersection of complexity science, AI, and systems engineering. And uh, uh, with respect to AI and PSC for the next 30 years, uh, I think this data science um, phase that we have entered into will have a huge impact. And some of the dreams some of us had in the 80s and 90s uh, will become uh, realities in the next 20, 30 years because the convergence is here. We have the communication, we have the uh, uh, software, hardware powers, and so on and so forth. But work along these lines still need to be developed, and I think it'll touch us all aspects of uh, BSC. So thank you, George, uh, both for your contributions as well as your continued support uh, all along my uh, career. And happy 70th birthday, and I hope you get to do more of the dancing. And I also hope you get to enjoy the sea some more. And this is George here, and that's Eleni. And uh, you might be able to drag this guy along because uh, supposedly he seems to have retired. That's what I hear. That's Manfred Morari there. And, uh, and this guy hiding in the back seems to be going in the wrong direction. Uh, he's just added on more work onto his plate. You can't see very well that's uh, Tom Edgar. So this was uh, uh, the boat ride we all took after the cash meeting in Bahamas in 1995. So let me stop at this point, and uh, thank you. So I've been given a, now the soft constraint of 30 minutes for the speakers has now become a hard constraint, apparently. So questions, please, for them. Yes. So Venkat, thanks for the nice overview. Thank you. Um, you know, when you showed the slide that said, here's what we did in the mid 80s, and here are the 10 reasons, seven reasons why it was not the right time and it was low impact. Here's a question I have. You were there at that time. <clears throat> I'm sure your goal was not to do research that had low impact, right? I'm sure that was not your goal. But <clears throat> when you looked at those seven reasons, were they just not obvious, or did you not really care? You still wanted to work on the problem, whether it was the right time or not the right time. Uh, personally speaking, it's a little of both. Uh, I underestimated um, the, uh, uh, the lack of the uh, technology sophistication needed for in-plant use. So we were all thinking, you know, look, in you know, our lab, this, this thing works well. Why don't we throw it inside a control room and you know, get the operators up and going? So I really underestimated the user acceptance part and all the technology. This is what I meant as implementational and organizational challenges. I really underestimated how much that would take. For example, to take that and, and, for, uh, and then for Honeywell to commercialize it or for an Aspen-like software to come along. I really underestimated the... Uh, uh, the uh, the organizational challenge and the implementational challenge. Uh, that only became clear uh, in retrospect. Uh, and the second one was, I really wanted to work on those things anyway. So it's partly, I didn't care as long as you had tenure. I said, okay, I'm, this is what I'm supposed to do, we work on things that I care about. And uh, 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 so it's, it's a combination of both, you know, personally uh, speaking. All right, thanks very much. Yeah. It's Professor Bavik uh, Bakshi. Uh, Bavik joined George's group at MIT in 1986, having graduated with a degree in chemical engineering uh, from the University of Bombay. With 16 papers in his name, he was probably the most prolific of George's students. His research work has involved multi-scale of uh, process operations using wavelet decomposition, Bayesian data analysis and modeling, 
and environmentally conscious and sustainable process engineering, where he is considered one of the international leaders. Research excellence, he's, re he's been recognized as a research excellence in sustainable engineering by AICHE, uh, Sustainable Engineering Forum 2012. Uh, he does research in, in various areas, uh, including ecologically based life cycle assessment, statistical methods for LCA, design for sustainability, dynamics of coupled natural and human systems, and with applications across a variety of areas, including uh, uh, products and, and systems, including uh, transportation fuels, polymer nanocomposites, ionic liquids, and bio-based uh, materials. Also has applications in uh, industrial supply chain design and development of a sustainable campus. Uh, he has degrees in Bachelor of Chemical Engineering from University of Bombay, as I mentioned, in 1986. Masters from MIT 1989 and PhD, of course, from uh, MIT 92. Uh, uh, he is currently professor of chemical and biomedical engineering at Ohio State University, holding the Richards M. Morrow Endowed Chair in Chemical Engineering since 2017. So, congratulations for that. Please welcome uh, our speaker. Well, thank you very much for that uh, kind introduction. And uh, thank you, George, for uh, this opportunity. And uh, I mean, there's too much to thank for. I'll get to it at the end. Uh, but before I, I talk about uh, the title, which many of you have asked me uh, about, you know, what does this mean and what am I going to talk about? Well, we'll find out. Um, I want to just give you a little bit of background. Um, so when I, you know, I mean, we have heard uh, backgrounds of a lot of people who have presented over here and through conversations with individuals and through the marvelous uh, uh, evening uh, event we had yesterday, I wasn't one of those people who came to MIT to work for George. I came to MIT because it was MIT, and I did not know what I wanted to do. You know, I came in, I wanted to do a PhD that I knew, what I wanted to do it in, who I wanted to work for, I really had no idea. And I ended up, uh, you know, um, uh, joining the group and George accepting me, thank you for that, uh, you know, more because it just seemed to be the thing to do. You know, uh, his talk I remember very well, uh, which he gives, which all faculty would give to incoming students, was very interesting. And it sounded fascinating, so I thought, okay, well, you know, I have to do something, might as well do this. And it even sounds interesting. But I, I wasn't one of those people totally driven to work on PSC and stuff like that. My first two years were pretty hard, and I don't know how much of that you remember, but, uh, you know, the, the first two years, uh, were among the most difficult years of my life so far, the first two years of the PhD. <laughs> and, uh, you know, at the end of the two years, I actually switched projects. Uh, you know, thanks to Jarvis and the work that he was doing over there, looking at uh, trend analysis and so on. Uh, thanks also to a New York Times article on wavelets uh, that came out roughly February of 1988, I think. Uh, and of course, thanks to George. Uh, you know, and after the rest, you know, once I switched projects, and I think I also realized that I'm here, I better do something rather than just, you know, waste my time. Uh, much to my own frustration, I'm sure also to George's frustration. Uh, and I finally, finally decided that, well, I'm going to, you know, do the best I can. Uh, I think I just needed to become more mature, probably. You know, I, I would love to know what George's uh, memories of that period are, but nevertheless. So, you know, so, so here I was, you know, I, I got a uh, PhD and I, I did not know I wanted to go, in, go into academia, but then, you know, I, once, I, once research got going and it, it, it looked really good, thanks to George's mentorship and support and also occasional um, scolding. Uh, uh, if you don't remember, I'll remind you, but privately. <laughs> um, you know, I mean, the thing that I took away was that with this kind of training that I got, and, and you know, all of us who had the pleasure of, and the privilege of working with George got, is the confidence to be able to look at pretty much any problem from that systems point of view, that systematic way of thinking, you know, is something that uh, I think is, to me at least, been the most valuable uh, you know, uh, learning that I got uh, from the uh, PhD uh, time that I spent uh, over here. All right, so now that I have that out of the way, Let's talk about Star Trek. Uh, 
may be more interesting. So, um, you know, um, so the, the previous talk, you know, what Venkat was talking about, I, I think set the stage over here nicely, talking about complexity and the need to understand emergence and, uh, and, and things like that. In general, you know, among engineering uh, communities in particular, uh, if somebody comes up and starts talking about, you know, oh, there's climate change and there is ecological degradation and water scarcities and so on, a very common reaction is, we have technology. We'll solve the problems, okay? And yeah, that is certainly one possible worldview, that of a technological optimist. And then there is the other side where people are like, oh, the sky is falling on our head, you know, and so on. And that's sort of the other extreme. I'm not going to try and predict the future over here. Because, you know, people have tried that. They've, they've, they've used the term, you know, uh, uh, put their neck out, so to say. I'm not going to do that. What I'm going to do instead is take a slightly different approach and think about the possible worldviews that we could adopt today, okay? And what implications those might have for the future, and then think about, so which worldview would we want to adopt today, should we adopt today? And there is a certain subjectiveness in there, as you will see. And then think about, so for that particular worldview that might seem less risky, what are the possibilities and the opportunities and the challenges for PSE? So what is the 2040 vision based on that? So slightly different way of approaching this whole thing. So one worldview that I mentioned uh, that uh, you know, many people have, many of us have, is, the is that of the technological optimist. So here, as, as I mentioned already, technology will solve all problems. We don't need to worry about resource constraints. If we run out of uh, one resource, we'll find another, as we have historically. Uh, we ran out of whale oil, so then we started using you know, other fuels. Finally, uh, you know, crude oil. Uh, now most of our lighting comes from electricity, which comes from a variety of sources, including solar, wind, hydro, and so on. And environmental challenges are also not really something to worry about, because as societies, societies get richer, uh, people tend to value environmental things more, and there are regulations and so on, the so-called uh, that curve uh, in economics. Innovation and progress are encouraged by competition. The free market, as practiced today, is able and is going to be able to find appropriate solutions uh, to uh, economic environmental problems, including, uh, you know, possibly the inequality problems that Venkat uh, uh, talked about. And that should be and is the guiding principle. And from an engineering perspective, the current paradigm that we have been following for at least the last uh, you know, two, three hundred years, um, which is that of dominating and controlling nature, that's what engineering in a sense you know, is all about, uh, is appropriate. So we should continue doing that. Okay, so that's one worldview. I'm not telling you, you know, I'm not giving you my opinion over here, I'm just telling you one possible worldview. You can decide where you stand. So that's the technological optimist. There is the technological skeptic, not pessimist, but skeptic, where you know, the thinking is, well, technological breakthroughs, you know, yes, they will happen, but they may not happen as quickly as we need them to happen, or they may not happen at all. Maybe there are limits you know, to human ingenuity, and we may not be able to overcome all the challenges purely by our ingenuity. So instead of relying purely on the free market, you know, maybe more rely on human cooperation to come up with broader societal goals um, and, um, you know, use the markets where they are appropriate for achieving those goals. And the current engineering paradigm needs to shift from that of wanting to dominate nature to one where we respect nature and learn to work within its limits and with nature. So which worldview should we adopt now for a better future? That's the question that I'd like to pose. Should we take the technological optimist worldview or the technological skeptic worldview? And what role might PAC end up playing in either worldview? And keep in mind that the worldview we adopt today is going to affect the future. And what are the ways in which the worldview today could affect the future? Let's talk about that. OK, so one possibility is a Star Trek future. So if we adopt the technological optimist worldview, and it turns out to be correct, we're going to end up with Star Trek. In this future, there will be no limits to resources. Populations will continue to increase beyond the current 7.2 billion and the projected 10 billion, probably to 20 billion, 50 billion. 
we will colonize outer space. I should have music to go with this, but sorry, I don't. <laughs> but you can imagine the music. <clears throat> Thank you. <laughs> so, you know, in this kind of a future, a Star Trek future, you know, PSC will have a huge role. In fact, in many ways, PSC is already gearing up for this kind of, of a future, it seems. Automation, obviously, is very important. Lots of that is happening. Manufacturing in space colonies and manufacturing of space colonies. Geoengineering the climate, personalized, personalized medicine. We could go on. And we may already be on this path, you know. I mean, there is so much technology and so much stuff, you know, new stuff, ideas and so on that we have heard about just in the last couple of days uh, that it seems is a, you know, good indication that if indeed our technological optimist worldview turns out to be correct, we may, in, we may be in good shape. And this future, by the way, is sustainable. Okay? So that's good. All right. What if uh, we adopt the technological optimist worldview and it turns out to be wrong? That's Mad Max. If you haven't seen the movie, uh, you know, I'll show you one photo or you know, whatever, a poster from it. Uh, uh, but in that situation, you know, we are assuming that there is no limit to resources, so we keep developing and we assume that there are no limits to anything. We'll all, technology will always find a solution and guess what? It doesn't in the future. That, could, that would result in resource depletion, ecological degradation, societal collapse, and these kinds of things have happened on planet Earth at smaller scales. Uh, hasn't happened yet on a larger scale, but with this kind of a worldview if, and turning out to be incorrect, could result in a Mad Max future. And here's that poster from the movie. So, you know, it's just barren land, and a lot of engineering goes into building this kind of a vehicle, uh, uh, you know, so PSC might play a role there. Uh, <laughs> The kind of PSC that we would need at that time, I think, is we would need to rediscover the PSC of the past before computers. In fact, you know, the PSC of not the previous century, but the century before that even, maybe. And this is an unsustainable outcome. We don't want this. All right, moving on. If we adopt the technological skeptic worldview, and it turns out to be correct, so in this case, you know, we are going to assume that you know, uh, resources are not unlimited. We need to be more efficient. Things like the Paris Climate Accord do make sense. Uh, you know, if you haven't seen the news, I'm sure you have. I don't need to talk more about that, and I won't, because I'll go off on a tangent. Uh, <laughs> so you know, if that worldview turns out uh, you know, to be correct, then we would end up with ecotopia, where population would stabilize. Rampant consumerism is reined in. Our activities stay within planetary boundaries. And engineering respects nature and actually learns from it and learns to work with it rather than against it. So this is, I don't know, maybe Ecotopia will look something like this. You can imagine. PSC, in this kind of a future, would need to expand to include ecosystems within its system boundary, which it doesn't currently. Engineering would need to get away from its paradigm, shift its paradigm to learn from and respect nature. And manufacturing would need to operate not with less impact or zero impact, but with net positive impact. And not just economically and, uh, you know, and in terms of monetary values, but environmentally and societally, something that you know, most of the times cannot be claimed uh, today. And this also obviously is a sustainable outcome. All right, there is a fourth case remaining. If we adopt the technological skeptic worldview and turns out to be incorrect, we end up with Big Brother. What is Big Brother? You know, we'll have all these regulation that we will have to introduce, like the Paris Accord. Turns out we don't need it. Because, you know, and so in that case, government regulation turns out to be excessive. Environmental taxes are unnecessary. Respecting nature's limits is unnecessarily constraining. And economic growth, turns out, would end up being slower than it could have been. That's not good. So, oh, sorry, I should have shown this to you earlier. This is our, the, the big brother future. Now, in this situation, you know, PSC will need to shift 
towards the Star Trek future because, you know, this skeptic view turned out to be wrong. So now we can go to Star Trek, all cylinders firing. This, by the way, is not an ideal outcome, but this is also a sustainable outcome. So which worldview is appropriate? To summarize, the current worldviews and policies, this technological optimist is one possibility. If we assume technological optimism and optimists turn out to be right, then we uh, end up with Star Trek. We, if the technological optimism turns out to be incorrect, we end up with Mad Max. Technological skepticism, if that's what we assume, uh, and it turns out to be right, we get Ecotopia, otherwise we get Big Brother. So which one is the appropriate worldview that we should adopt, adopt today? The future will obviously, you know, it seems depend on that. It seems to me that the technological skeptic worldview is the safer bet, because both options are sustainable. In the technological optimist worldview, Star Trek is great, Mad Max is absolutely horrible and totally unsustainable. We absolutely don't want that. So the technological skeptic worldview is a safer, is a safer bet. So moving to 2040 visions of PSE, with this kind of a worldview, what do we need? The things we need, and I, I said some of this, I'm going to repeat it a little bit again, you know, because I think it's, it's important is that we need to shift the engineering paradigm to respect and learn from nature. We need to expand engineering to include ecosystems within its system boundary. And we need to operate manufacturing with net positive impact. So what I want to do in the next uh, maybe uh, uh, eight minutes or so is talk about some efforts in this direction, okay? Which are essentially trying to you know, bring, you know, address these kinds of challenges or these kinds of issues and also then uh, you know, talk about what else is there. And there are a huge number of opportunities and challenges if this is what we are going to try to achieve uh, in the interest of getting a future that is less risky than the alternative, which, you know, is much more risky. So, uh, um, you know, going back a little bit to the history of uh, process systems engineering and the efforts in there uh, with, re with respect to uh, you know, improving efficiency and environmental protection and things like that. I don't need to tell any of you uh, this, you know that. But there's a lot of work that has been done starting, uh, you know, with uh, pinch technology and, uh, uh, you know, uh, increasing efficiency. Uh, uh, more recently, uh, efforts on increasing eco-efficiency, incorporating life cycle analysis uh, types of results in engineering decisions. Many of you here have done lots of work uh, in, in this area. So in that case, what we are doing is we are considering our technological systems, maybe a single system, maybe an entire life cycle, maybe an enterprise, maybe multiple enterprises. And uh, you know, what we try to do is to basically increase their efficiency. So we try to make our products with minimum waste, minimum pollution, and minimum use of raw materials. So that is certainly a step in the direction towards you know, trying to reduce our impact on the environment. There is other work also that is going on uh, and these days, it's becoming, it's become sort of popular. There's a buzzword out there or a term called circular economy. Uh, industrial symbiosis, byproduct synergy. These are other terms that are out there, eco-industrial parks. And there is some work within the PSC community on that also, where the idea is to try and emulate nature, learn from nature and emulate it by using some of the wastes as resources. So, you know, uh, and maybe an obvious example of that is ash from a coal burning power plant goes into making uh, concrete or cement. So this kind of work is also happening. If we really want to respect nature and incorporate its limits, we need to take ecosystems into account also in an explicit way. So you know, what we need to do is to move towards a techno-ecological synergy where the technological systems we take into account, you know, what are the emissions coming out from that? They go into ecosystems and the ecosystems, what is the capacity of ecosystems to absorb those wastes? And what kind of resources can nature then provide for technological systems to use? So this is something that isn't quite happening yet, but that, you know, according to at least that worldview that I showed you on the previous slide, is what seems to be needed. So this is one of the, those you know, visions for 2040. From a sustainability point of view, ideally what we would like is to 
increase this synergy between technologically and ecological systems so that this brown arrow and the green arrow are actually thicker. And these arrows, the raw materials and the pollutants, essentially disappear. And we go to something like this, or are at least minimized within thermodynamic limits. So this would be a sustainable techno-ecological synergy. So we've been you know, thinking about this idea and wondering, first of all, whether this makes any sense. And through this thinking, one thing that has come out is this idea of, of incorporating ecological systems like wetlands and forest ecosystems as if they were unit operations in chemical engineering process design. So here is a flow sheet of a biodiesel process. And there is a, co a, a CHP process combined heat and power unit right here. And, uh, you know, I mean, uh, uh, we all know how to do design of these things. There's a lot of work on that. But usually, you know, ecosystems are things that we don't include in design. But if we now want to establish a techno-ecological synergy, we need to also include ecosystems explicitly within our design. So in order to evaluate whether this that makes any sense or not. We actually considered a biodiesel manufacturing uh, facility. This is outside of Cincinnati in Ohio. And we said, well, uh, sorry. Oh, uh, the color is invisible for some reason. But anyway, so here is the biodiesel facility. And we said, you know, uh, this biodiesel facility also has CHP. It is emitting certain pollutants, you know, carbon dioxide, sulfur dioxide, nitrogen oxides, carbon monoxide, particulate matter, and so on. And also some wastewater. So if there were trees, on this land, would they have the capacity to take up the air emissions that are coming out from this, uh, from this facility? Now, trees, as you know, do take up CO2. But sulfur dioxide and nitrogen oxides, uh, oxides are also um, uh, nutrients for trees, up to a limit, though. There is a threshold beyond which, if there is more SO2 or NOx, then the trees will die. But below us, so that limit, and that limit is, uh, you know, um, staying within that limit is ensured by regulations of the US EPA. So we are assuming that we have, we are satisfying regulations. What we are trying to do is to go to net positive manufacturing. So what we found, and I'm not going to get, get into details of that. I don't have the time for it. But uh, there is an article that we published uh, last year in AICHE journal, where we essentially showed that, you know, the trees, if we planted trees over here in this region, then uh, if the trees were uh, even just 15 years old, they would be able to take up all the NOx and all the SO2 that was being emitted from this facility. If the trees were older, then uh, there would be excess capacity that could then be used to take up the NOx and SO2 from other manufacturing facilities that line the Ohio River, or from the trucks that go on this road, or uh, there's a railway track up here, and so on. So that would then become potentially net positive impact manufacturing. Okay, people aren't quite thinking this way yet, but it's happening. Dow Chemical is one company that is thinking this way. So we've been working with them on this. The other one that we know of is, is Eastman Chemical, because we've been working with them also on evaluating this for their manufacturing sites. We also consider a treatment wetland over here. And there also the treatment wetland, a fairly small area, you know, was able to meet uh, the needs of this particular uh, facility. What I want to show you are the Pareto curves, which are right here on this slide. And this is the annualized net present value. And this is using conventional economics, neoclassical economics. Nothing, uh, no, none of the environmental, ecological economics kind of stuff uh, uh, is in here. And uh, this is the net water supply. So we want to maximize this objective as well as this objective. And this is the Pareto curve we find with a conventional water treatment facility, which is an uh, anaerobic uh, baffled reactor. So as all of you know, uh, in this region, we would have feasible designs. But because this is the Pareto curve, we really wouldn't have any feasible designs here. But if we could find designs in this region, they would be innovative. Okay. So uh, if we now go to a treatment wetland and include it in our design, we can move the Pareto curve in the innovation space by a little bit. If we now integrate design, meaning we do proper process integration and integrate the wetland with the process. So we modify our manufacturing process so that the water it produces can be handled by the wetland. Uh, in that case, we even move more into the innovation space. And if we now recycle the water from the wetland back to the process, then we get these Pareto curves, which are you know, much better from a water point of view. But if you look carefully, 
The net present value of this point is actually larger than the net present value of the conventional case. So there is potentially a win-win opportunity. You can make more money and use less water, even with conventional methods, conventional economics. Now, if you take into account the benefits to society from something like this, then it will look even better. And we have not taken that into account over here. That's something that we are working on in collaboration with environmental economists. We have looked at this over the entire United States, and I'm going to only spend 30 seconds on this. Uh, uh, but all the blue areas or regions are counties of the country where um, there is enough land available uh, and enough vegetation available to take up the pollution of uh, SO2, I believe in this case, yeah, SO2, from each of these counties. If we were to restore ecosystems in, uh, you know, across the, the country, uh, then this capacity to take up SO2 would increase even more. And uh, this slide shows that, but I'm going to skip it. But move on to the next slide, which shows that in the lighter counties, it actually is economically cheaper to restore nature rather than put in control equipment. So traditional engineering, the so-called gray infrastructure, turns out is more expensive in all the light color counties to take up SO2 emissions as compared to ecological or so-called green infrastructure. <clears throat> so, you know, I mean, one thing you may be thinking, I mean, including ecosystems and so on, yeah, but ecosystems behave very differently. Eric talked about, uh, Eric Itzti talked about, uh, you know, the very different behavior of physical systems and man-made systems and so on. And yes, there are huge differences. And those need to be addressed. And there are lots of, you know, practical and theoretical challenges over there. Uh, so one thing from a dynamics and control of techno-ecological systems point of view that we are envisioning and working towards is we would have a manufacturing system and it would have, you know, the usual uh, inputs and products and byproducts and wastes and this is the technological waste treatment systems. But we would also have the forests and the wetlands, and we would have control systems that actually now there are these distributed arrays of sensors uh, that measure what the ecosystem is able to do, and then incorporate that within our control systems and so on, and have essentially uh, you know, a, a 2040 vision type of uh, operation and control system that enables uh, and benefits from synergy between the technological and the ecological systems. What is needed is not to just go, you know, uh, uh, is to go beyond the supply chain, life cycle economy and so on. We need to bring in ecosystems into all of these phases, okay? And I've only talked about really the, the process uh, case over here. And there are challenges beyond engineering. Uh, in engineering, engineers are very low ecological literacy, so, you know, we need to, there are lots of educational challenges but also plenty of economics and policy challenges. Human attitude and behavior are also challenges, and I'm not going to get into those details. They're outside of conventional PSE at least, but they do need to be included, as Gabriela also mentioned in her talk yesterday. So my vision of a 2040 PSE is a PSE that enables engineering that functions in synergy with nature. So last slide then is a salute to my guru. Guru, in case you did not know, it's a Sanskrit word. And I don't expect, well, some of you, uh, you know, uh, Venkat and, uh, you know, some of you may be able to read what it says. I'll give you a translation in a minute. But guru means somebody who takes away uh, darkness. So that's the Sanskrit, Sanskrit meaning of the remover of darkness. That's the meaning of guru. So what this uh, Sanskrit uh, uh, verse, it's about 5,000 years old, says is... Uh, Basically, guru creates and sustains knowledge and destroys the weeds of ignorance. So I salute to my guru. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Again, thank you for keeping on time. So questions, please. Yep, at the back. Perfect. Thanks for the nice talk. Uh, I have a quick question. When you did this sustainability analysis with the, uh, with the biodiesel plant, I mean, that is actually a reasonably greener plant. So I would be interested in knowing whether you have looked at rather uh, polluting such as coal-fired power plants 
Or do you, uh, do you have a way to normalize that so that you can say so many carbon you know, divided and then so many trees for so many carbon, sulfur dioxide, nitrogen? So that will be a good comparison. Yeah, so you know, that's a valid question. And the short answer is yes, we have looked at other facilities also. And they don't look as green as the biodiesel facility. But, I, but you know, when we started, we wanted to start with a simpler problem. Uh, for the coal uh, power plant, what is needed, and, uh, and that's what we are working on, is you have to rely on other regions. So you need to rely on things like trading of emissions and things like that. So that's something that I have a student working on it. We have results. We'll most likely present them in the ASCHE meeting in November. Yes, please. Uh, thanks for the talk. Uh, in, in many ways, I think, coming from Europe, this sounds like uh, so, such an obvious thing to say that I'm a bit surprised it needs to be said. Uh, but maybe here it does, especially the day after you know, yesterday. Um, uh, there are, I think it's, it's a duty for process systems to consider the right envelope. And you can look at a piece of equipment, and it's not correct. You can look at a factory, and it's not correct. So where do you put your uh, envelope? You need to put there where the utility uh, function is. And so the, we need to consider what the utility function is in this context. And it seems to me that there are so many interactions where we are still missing if we don't consider the uh, environmental aspects, that we're not doing our job, you know, quite frankly. We are, will be sub-optimizing or, or getting it wrong. Right. Uh, let me give an example. Uh, if you consider cycling in London, uh, there is a benefit that has been quantified to about 500 pounds per person uh, for a person you know, cycling in London to work, minimal distances. So you know, the right policy issue would be to give everybody a free uh, bicycle, you know, cut down some of the lanes, eliminate the traffic so, so you don't have the 25 or odd you know, deaths that would otherwise have by traffic accidents. And, and that is a simple systems op optimization, just considering the envelope a bit wider where the transport is associated with uh, you know, health benefits. You know, the health benefits come from uh, you know, more circulatory things, which... Uh, as uh, uh, you know, the conference uh, this morning explained, you know, keep, keeps you, your, your brain going as well as your, uh, your health going. So th th it is our duty to now widen the uh, envelope to include you know, all the relevant bits. And it seems to me that the opportunity comes from the immense power that we have to do calculation, to do other things. So you know, please, let's stop thinking about plants and consider about the green plants as well, but all the cities, all the other opportunities that we have, uh, and uh, you know, do our justice to our profession, you know, who, who have the opportunity to do this uh, wider systems analysis. Yeah, I mean, I, I can only agree with you, except for one thing. I don't think this is that obvious, because there is so much work that has been done over the last couple of centuries even, or let's only think of the last few decades, there is a lot of work on reducing the impact of emissions. But if you look at life cycle assessment, look at sustainable engineering, look at even environmental economics kind of work, what is not included in them is the capacity of nature to supply the services that we demand from them. That's the new thing. That is the thing that is missing. Okay, so when we talk about synergies between technological and ecological systems, it means we actually take into account how much can nature supply to us. And we do our design in that, in that way. The rest of it, 100% agreement, you know, it is something that, I mean, it's our responsibility to do this. And we do have the power and the models and so on now to actually do such stuff. We're going to stop it here. I have to apologize. If we can take that question to the break. Yeah. Uh, we need to move on. Our next speaker, please thank um, Bavi. Thank you. Don't go away. So our next speaker, I'll do the introduction while the photo is taking place. Vasilios, uh, Professor Vasilios uh, Manosio Takis. 
is our uh, next speaker. And uh, Vasilios was George's student in his first course at the National Technical Univers University of Athens, 1980-1981. He went on to work for his PhD with George's former PhD student, Yaman Akun, at RPI. Uh, and Vasilios is known for many contributions in process control, process synthesis, optimization, and environmental engineering, including uh, block relative array, the IDEAS, I-D-E-A-S, conceptual framework for linear program-based process network synthesis with environmental considerations, uh, his creation of the field of mass exchange uh, networks, and many other uh, contributions. He has been recognized by, by AICHE Research Excellence in Sustainable Engineering Award 2014 and the AICHE Environmental Division Lawrence K. Cecil Award 2010. And he is an AICHE Fellow since 2012. He has been at UCLA since 1985 and uh, where he currently holds the rank uh, of professor. I looked at uh, Vasilius' uh, tree or branch of the George's tree, and he has grown his academic tree quite uh, impressively already with more than 20 PhD students, 50 grandchildren, seven great-grandchildren, and three great-great-grandchildren. So this is one branch of the tree, George, that is, you know, of course, it doesn't need pruning. It's a branch that is <laughs> the other branches, the other branches need to follow. Please. Thank you very Please much for a very speech. kind introduction. It's a great privilege and honor to be here, George and everybody. Uh, it's, a, it's a once in a lifetime event. It will be remembered for, uh, you know, hopefully a few centuries. I always think big, as you know. <laughs> um, you probably know through your interactions with me over the years, that uh, very often I would go and ask people what is the title of their talk, and try to... And I've refrained from uh, naming the titles when I'm doing the introductions, for so I'll leave it up to you to do that. Yes. Um, try to guess what the content is. <laughs> so, um, I hope I have uh, been successful in uh, uh, making sure that you don't know what the contents of my talk are. Uh, I will... Uh, okay, I'm doing something messy here. <laughs> the. So the outline is, uh, I'm going to first give some explanations so that we all know what hopefully I'm going to talk about. And then uh, I'm going to discuss uh, George's uh, enormous impact on my research and education. Uh, then I'm going to branch into uh, climate change as a uh, major issue for uh, our lifetime. And then uh, I will uh, try to provide uh, some uh, insight into how process systems engineering could uh, function as uh, what I defined as Yuri Faesa. So who is uh, Yuri Faesa? Uh, she is a titan. Uh, this is a, uh, uh, essentially a tree that describes all the ancient Greek gods. And uh, this is the pre-Olympian god era who were called titans. So, Initially, it was chaos, and then came Earth, who uh, had, uh, with the Immaculate Conception, the son of Uranus, who then uh, somehow generated a number of children with her, uh, Eurypheusa being uh, one of them. And of course, uh, other children got together and then created Prometheus, that I'm going to also talk about. And uh, the other major connection I want you to pay attention to is the children of Eurypheusa with uh, another child, Hyperion, who were the sun, the moon, and the, and the dawn. And then the dawn had again more children from other descendants, 
And these were the winds, the south, the north, and uh, Zephyr, the all-encompassing wind. So Eurypheza is uh, white shining, the meaning, uh, Titan, and uh, essentially is uh, known to be uh, the goddess who endows gold and silver, their intrinsic value. Uh, in present day terms, the color that I assign to that is green for the dollar. Uh, and then, uh, of course, uh, the, the more important property or function is uh, that she's the mother. So uh, that was the primary uh, function I was attributing to her when I used her in my title. Prometheus in the, is the other uh, titan that you will find in the title. And uh, again, I described the uh, tree. He is a god of forethought. And uh, he was uh, essentially designated uh, by Zeus to be in the east. Uh, his uh, most uh, important uh, function was that, uh, or at least what he's known for mostly, is that uh, he essentially participated, although a titan, in the fight against the titans with Zeus. And uh, after the, the battle in the celebrations, uh, nevertheless, he tried to fool Zeus. And uh, following that uh, squabble, uh, Zeus decided instead of punishing titan, Punishing the humans, and he essentially uh, did not give them the ability to have fire. Then uh, Prometheus uh, stole the fire, and uh, as a result, he was put in chains, and uh, Nigo was sent to eat his liver during the day while it regenerated during the night. So many depictions of Prometheus uh, throughout uh, history. This is uh, from an ancient uh, Greek uh, construction. And uh, he was essentially uh, celebrated uh, throughout the years as a human hero, the, the person that uh, you know, gave us fire. Of course, in uh, Greece, uh, there were uh, several environmental catastrophes that took place. One at uh, 12th century BC, and it had uh, a lot of to do with uh, essentially the, the destruction of the ecosystem. And then uh, subsequently, once the ramifications and impact of this initial disaster were uh, kind of forgotten, then uh, another disaster came in the fourth century BC, very similar destruction with the trees and so on. Now, uh, essentially, Prometheus was very frequently throughout history uh, portrayed as a benefactor of humankind, the person that liberated humanity. But nevertheless, it may be uh, another alternative viewpoint that Prometheus may have also provided uh, not necessarily a great service to humanity, because he put forward fire as a simple utilitarian tool and essentially uh, gave the possibly false impression to humans that they could operate outside and in spite of their ecosystem. Uh, that could be a dangerous uh, uh, position and uh, philosophy. So the point that I am going to be making is if we are thinking that fire is all about burning stuff, it may be time to reconsider the Prometheus paradigm. The other word that you will see in the title is tautology, which uh, essentially uh, in mathematical logic is uh, a logical statement which is always true. And uh, I'm going to try to make a connection of that with climate change. You remember that I talked about 
the various descendants of Eurypheza. So we were talking about the sun. Well, maybe this is the message. Uh, nice, big, concentrated solar power plants uh, may be the best thing we should be pursuing, taking advantage of these resources that Eurypheza made available to us. Uh, this is the Ivan Pa plant in uh, the desert uh, going from LA to Vegas. It has three big towers, an enormous uh, array of mirrors. It still does not generate the highest possible temperatures that these kinds of plants can generate, which could reach 2,000 degrees C. Uh, this is just being used at this point just for the low ambition goal of just generating power from a steam power plant. Uh, aside from that, if you remember, the second child was the moon. Well, these are enormous plants that take advantage of the tides. They are, uh, this one is uh, in France and another one in uh, Canada. So maybe that's another direction we could be pursuing. Uh, taking advantage of another renewable energy source. Uh, if you remember, Dawn had three suns. They were the winds. Well, here's another renewable energy source. Maybe we should be taking advantage of that. Another present that maybe we haven't taken advantage of enough. Now, going to the climate change issue. Uh, this is a statement of the IPCC talking about global warming and about uh, how uh, irreversible impacts of people and ecosystems are. I am not pretending to be a climate scientist, but I can read papers. So, first of all, on the data. Uh, these are uh, concentrations of carbon dioxide that are being uh, regularly registered by uh, NOAA, and they do show a systematic increase over the last uh, 60 years of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. They are, although they are at Mauna Loa, clearly there's no carbon dioxide generation, so we can feel comfortable that diffusion is playing its role and making sure that we are talking about reliable measurements. Um, they are consistent with global data as well. This is a much longer time scale, and uh, this one is uh, over thousands of years, and we do see again that we have a spike in carbon dioxide that has not occurred over thousands of years, hundreds of thousands of years. So that is pretty much a settled issue then we can say. Carbon dioxide is at pretty much enormous levels in the history of Earth. Um, on the temperature side now, we have a variety of data, and I simply want you to look at the curve and then, uh, you know, just watch its fluctuations. Uh, this seems to indicate that we are having an increase over a, a significant period of time. This is, again, data of, of a century and a half. Um, Similar uh, situation here. These are global temperature data. Uh, but then there are some other uh, curves as well uh, that, you know, we have uh, uh, Greenland temperatures, for example, which uh, are at uh, uh, pretty low uh, condition compared to what they were uh, several uh, some, some 10,000 years ago. Now, another issue is the carbon cycle. Where is the carbon going? And the only thing that I you know, want to show you in this cartoon is how enormous this number is compared to everything else. So basically, most of our carbon is in the crust. So, uh, now, I have arbitrarily uh, after doing some, you know, fairly shallow uh, literature review of, of this uh, climate change um, 
you know, field. Uh, I have focused on uh, some uh, recommended uh, publications uh, related to the CMIP model uh, by LLNL. And I like this one in particular because it was talking about doing comparison of eight CMIP models. One thing that I found interesting is uh, when you see models typically in this uh, literature, you do not see equations. The equations are somehow uh, absent, mostly. So uh, now, if we look at this conclusion from this paper, we find out that this is 2013, 2013. There's a comparison of about eight models, and essentially there's this statement which says land cover change is a significant difference between going from CMIP4 to CMIP5. So that means the models before CMIP5 we're not considering whether or not the temperature recordings they were making, if they were next to a forest, they would be perhaps affected by this forest having vanished over the years, and now this being next to a city. So this factor of land use, uh, land cover change, has then been introduced from four to five, and then we look at the relation of this factor, and then we look at that it's the difference between NBP and NEP, where these things are defined here. Let's look at the differences here. These are rather pronounced. Before you consider the factor, you're at 978, now you're at minus 120. So you are not even getting the sign right, whether or not the carbon is going from the atmosphere uh, down or from down to the atmosphere. So significant variation is what one can say. And then progressively you go back into the same uh, paper, you look at the appendix, you finally find some equations, and then you start to realize, well, these are, yes, equations, but they're all empirical laws. Oh, this is what happens to photosynthesis. This is what happens to that, and so on and so forth. We're familiar with this business. You know, we, we know what this is. It's not like some kind of fundamental law that has been discovered that captures these effects. So, uh, these climate change models are from a very uh, common website. And then uh, you start to see there are other assumptions that are being listed oh, I am one-dimensional, oh, I'm doing this approximation, I'm taking vertical profiles, and so on and so forth. So I'm not going to focus too much on the equations. I'm just showing them to you just to realize that this is kind of our business. We could make it our business if we wanted to. Uh, maybe we should be making it our business. Nevertheless, uh, we at least myself, and I know many, many, many others, like to think about synthesis. This field is largely about analysis. So now what we have is a variety of conclusions that are being reached from all of these works. And again, I'm not going to spend too much time on that. But there's the pros, and then there's the cons. That's the only message I have to say. And here's the pros, and then there are some cons, and you cannot dismiss a Nobel laureate. Uh, someone gave him the Nobel. So uh, the other personally discomforting thing to me is the notion that we're doing science by voting. And I don't think that's what science is about. Uh, I don't pretend to be Galileo Galilei, but, you know, at least... I'm happy that he had made this statement a long time ago. So um, Climate Change, this is a brand new book of a critic. Uh, if you're interested, you can see his testimony on YouTube uh, to Congress. 
And uh, you, know, you, you hear a variety of things about global warming and so on and so forth. The models failed miserably. They weren't even close, and so on. Um, and, and give some analysis of this. So uh, one set of data is this way. Oh, if I take the data, I do something else to it. It goes another way. And it keeps going like that. So you have significant variations. At least someone is coming out there making different interpretations. Maybe he's wrong. Uh, nevertheless, uh, what I want to summarize is out of all of this that we have observed, especially from the fluctuations of the temperatures, is that climate change is a zero information statement. It's an always true statement, unless we want to consider a set of measures zero over which it's not true. So um, if we as a society have moved from the notion that we have global warming, which is a statement that has information in it, it's a propositional logic, it could be true or false, and we have moved to a tautology, then what is the point of making this transition? What are we trying to say? That we didn't get even the sign right? So I don't know. I'm, my, my antennas are up. But first, before I go on and say, this is a debate or a discussion or a scientific uh, thought process that I don't even really care about, as I will explain later, because I think it's obsolete and needs to be avoided. Uh, I want to come to George, because essentially uh, he has given me a lot of the motivation and a lot of the thought process that I wanted to achieve when I decided to come to the US to you know, show people how great I am. So uh, I had George as a, a professor at NDU. We were doing a, a, a project uh, in, in his class. And at some point in time, I came and told him, well, I really you know, don't care too much about this stuff. I want to do control. So tell me where to go. And he took out a little card, and I don't remember all the names he wrote on it. He wrote a few names. I remember some of them. Manfred, Yaman, uh, McGregor, uh, and uh, you know, one more person. <laughs> so uh, so I, I applied. Oh, Dale Seberg. And uh, after I got some offers back, I said, look, Troy, it's this beautiful place. The weather is fantastic. I'm going. So, <laughs> so I joined the Amman's group. And um, you know, I started working on control. And I appreciate all that uh, Yaman has uh, done for me, uh, given me a lot of uh, uh, freedom, first of all and also insight into all the things that George had taught him. So after I uh, graduated from RPI, uh, I came to UCLA and I found my uh, very first syllabus uh, that I taught in my first uh, year at uh, uh, UCLA. Uh, over there, again, I had done only control during my uh, PhD thesis. Uh, but nevertheless, at that time, UCLA was interested in uh, applying to the National Science Foundation for an engineering research center on hazardous substance control. So then, you know, uh, I told them, okay, I'm tired. I'm going to Greece for vacation. I'll come in September. You know, there was some impact of that. They didn't get the proposal funded, but. Uh, then they reapplied, and they were successful. And of course, in that first proposal is when I decided, OK, well, Yaman and, and George in Athens have taught me all of this stuff about systems engineering and synthesis and heat exchange networks and all of these things. So I said, hey, I'm a control guy, but let me do that stuff as well. 
So then we you know, reach the point one year later where I'm producing this syllabus and most of this stuff I have learned during this um, period of years. Uh, talking about the reactor separation networks, heat exchange networks, and so on. And then, of course, I go into the details and you will see an amazing uh, influence in pretty much all the papers I was working on as um, I was trying to do my thesis and also uh, in my first years at uh, UCLA. So uh, George uh, was working with Manfred on uh, control structures. Okay, we together with Yaman think of the block relative gain. And then uh, uh, Manfred, Yaman, and George uh, were continuing on the structures things. Then uh, you know I'm doing some work on uh, uh, the nonlinear gain with uh, uh, Nicolau and then uh, go on uh, with a major review of uh, George Naunori and Art about process synthesis, and then the evolutionary synthesis of flow sheets, then I'm doing the mass exchange networks. And then, uh, again, the same review of process synthesis, then I'm introducing with my postdoc, Miguel Bagajevich, the state space representation. Then again, this notion of control structures decentralized and so on continues to infect everything I do. And uh, I decide, hey, you know, I may teach the double E some stuff. So I'm uh, essentially presenting a parameterization of all decentralized stabilizing controllers, a major issue that was not addressed at the time. And uh, also how to synthesize in a global manner by doing global optimality using interval analysis at that time, the best achievable decentralized performance with my PhD student, Dennis Sulas. And of course, the other major thing that I think, uh, as you will see later, is continuing even today, and I think it's gonna continue for time to come, is uh, this notion of uh, whatever you want to call them, thermochemical cycles, uh, uh, the chemical reaction path, solvate clusters, whatever the name, where uh, we did uh, you know, essentially an optimization formulation for this, following uh, George's uh, work uh, on, on the subject uh, with uh, Enrique and uh, Diana, and then uh, later with uh, uh, Mavrognotis. And then, uh, and then, you know, we said, oh, this decentralization theme can go even further. And uh, essentially, I uh, was influenced by this concept in decomposing the uh, information that I'm receiving in coming up with the ideas concept, which essentially you know, gave uh, rise to large linear programming formulations. And essentially, the decentralization came into the fact that you identify that rigorously most of the uh, operators that describe nonlinear systems uh, have uh, this uh, nice uh, decomposed structure, decentralized structure in a sense. And then, you know, we were doing this for heat exchange networks, showing the uh, application and how you can create a heat exchange network synthesis problems with the linear feasible region and so on. And, you know, we have done this now uh, for a variety of applications. We have over uh, 20 publications on the field. Initially, I remember people were telling me this is impossible, you know, cannot happen, how, how do you say these things? But I think we have gone past this point. Uh, we have demonstrated using this method that uh, this whole area of the uh, reactor network attainable region uh, has an inherent limitation in it. Namely, that it cannot consider diffusion. And if indeed one considers diffusion, then one can go past the reactor attainable region. So in this example here, we have used the dispersion model, and we have shown that with diffusion, you can get outside of the region. And uh, you know, we proposed the uh, shrink-wrap algorithm that was able to 
quantify all of these things uh, in a very efficient manner uh, by essentially discretizing. So what do I want to go suggest that we go from here? Um, essentially, I do not think we necessarily need to engage in the climate change discussion issue and so on. But I do think that we need to have uh, the, the concept of green engineering pursued by PSC. And uh, essentially, I want to emphasize the notion that we need to redesign the chemical industry. It is a brand new opportunity. The industry cannot be designed the way it was done before. So essentially, we need to bring forward our tools to the point where we can synthesize a new industry that uses hybrid energy resources, both renewable and fossil fuel. It does not generate CO2 emissions because we don't care if they create climate change or debate that issue, but rather because we can make money by not having carbon dioxide emissions. We can monetize the carbon. What we are doing emitting carbon dioxide is financially responsible and potentially harming environmentally. So we have been designing a number of plants where we are essentially showing that you can, for example, take natural gas and make, instead of carbon dioxide and hydrogen, formic acid and hydrogen. And how do we do that? The old technique that George talked about, thermochemical cycles. Here's a thermochemical cycle that does this. All of the reactions are known. The technology is developed. We don't need to invent catalysts. We don't need to invent anything. We just need to put the thing together. Two minutes. So we can do this in a variety of ways. This is the commercial process by bus. Same story. I can make formic acid from methane. I can create a plant from that. This plant emits no carbon dioxide. It takes in natural gas. Here's the profitability region. The current price of formic acid is over here. All of this region is profitable. The price can collapse by a factor of seven, and I'm still profitable. I can give away the hydrogen for free. So why aren't we doing this? It is beyond my comprehension. Uh, you want to make formic acid. Here's a few reactions you can do. A thermochemical cycle, no catalyst needed, no nothing. Put the whole thing together. Oh. <laughs> How do I do that? Okay, there. Uh, so uh, you, you can have a variety, you can have a, a multi-product plant where you produce methanol, you can produce formic acid, you can produce everything. We are designing a new industry. Let's not drop the ball. Uh, all the energetics work out. Here's a new plant. It only generates acidic acid, zero carbon dioxide emissions. So let's not continue thinking about carbon-containing chemicals as our enemy. They can make our wallets very thick with green dollars. All the economics work out. There's lots of carbon-containing chemicals out there. Let's start doing them one at a time. And then, oh, we don't need to only consider the carbon-containing chemicals. We can consider breaking water. You saw the solar towers. Well, here's a, a cycle we have patented. It breaks water. It uses three reactions. It can be done in a solar power tower. Uh, we need to keep eliminating the box. Uh, we all know reforming is endothermic. Well, no, it's not. So here's a reformer that is exothermic. Now, you may not call it a reformer because it has enormous amounts of CO circulating, but if you need to essentially utilize natural gas because, let's say, we decided to put a carbon tax, and the 
price of natural gas when used as fuel has jacked up tremendously, then you can go and do the calculations and find out that you can have enormous uh, opportunities where with the tax, if it's a 24 time increase from current price of natural gas, you would have essentially a factor of 10 in cost. And you can synthesize your plant by doing both combination of natural gas, but not as a fuel, but rather as raw material, and CSP to provide a lot of your energy. Uh, the ideas, concepts can be used to synthesize more intensified systems. You can synthesize reactive distillations that are much smaller. You can synthesize all of this range of separative reactors and so on. We have demonstrated uh, here uh, applications of uh, savings of 94%. So uh, when you have a tool that can really search the design space and it's not limited by local issues, local optimization issues, you really can find new stuff. So uh, I will close with a very quick uh, one-minute review of a new concept that I have proposed about what to consider a sustainable system. And essentially, I want to say that the system is sustainable if I put in a set in state space, and then I say that the system's trajectory is always say, stay within that set. It's a very well-known concept in the control and uh, dynamics community about set invariance. Essentially, what I can show you then is that you can do trivial levels of analysis. This is a very complicated system here. It has limit cycles and so on. You can do just algebra and essentially identify a invariant set. The system, as long as its initial condition is in here, never gets out. Now, even if the system, let's say I want to stabilize this set in that sense, in a sustainability sense, as you see, this comes out of my box. Well, then you can introduce a new concept in control that I call fortification. I don't care about going to a set point. I just want to stay in the set. That's all I care about. As long as I'm in the set, all is good. Then what do you do? You create a wall. And then you essentially make sure that your system, which before, as you see, goes out of the wall, now it stays in the wall. The mint approaches the wall, you essentially create tunnels through the wall, and you're redirecting it to other locations where it's going to re-enter, and then once it re-enters, you don't care what it does, as long as it doesn't approach the wall. If it approaches it, again, you take action. So the only action is happening at the wall. A very interesting concept, and we're essentially looking forward to uh, providing applications with it at a very large scale because all, everything is done algebraically. So we want to move humanity past the burning. Carbon is good. It's not bad. Uh, we want to have green engineering. And then two pieces of advice. Let's not our, drop our science, our chemical engineering. Let's not become computer scientists. I'm not against computer science. It's good to a, to a measure, to you know, an appropriate level. And then innovation. Break down the, the, the boxes in how you think. I want to acknowledge my students. And again, I want to thank George for everything. And Siderenius. Thank you very much. Maybe one quick question, please. Yes, at the back. Yes. Thank you, Vasily. Uh, just a, one point, though. As you said, and your data clearly show, on CO2, there's absolutely no doubt. We have exponential. We have a positive. Therefore, we have a positive uh, eigenvalue. Therefore, our current system is unstable. There's no and, argument there. And I and just told you what to do with it. Make money. Good. 
if we can do that, fantastic. But there's no argument. There's no if. I showed you how to do it. I wish I, I could, you know, I, I'll take roy lo royalties. <laughs> But I take, I maybe take, if I can make a comment, I take Vasilius' uh, comment on the fact that we should be making more contribution towards this uh, climate uh, change issue. I was at the CO2 summit number three in Italy last week, and mm -hmm. I was with another colleague, PSC colleague, amongst uh, different, you know, people from different fields in, in the climate change, and it, uh, we saw how we could actually make that impact in that community, and I think we should take that message. Thank you, Vasilios. Great Thank presentation. You very much. Thank you.